Hey, everybody, welcome back to another episode of the 6-5 Podcast, episode 183. Pat, we're, we're charging towards 200 from our Friday pod. And while that doesn't sound like a lot, when you're only doing it once a week, this has actually been quite a commitment. And it's one of the best days of my week every single week. And it's why you and I tough it out when we're on vacation, when we're overseas, or whatever else we've got going on. And I'm back from Munich. You're on a I'm putting vacation in quote because you've done a horrible job of it, Pat, but it's Friday. And by the way, this is the one part of the week where even when we are off, better to do it than not to do it. How are you doing today, buddy? Man, I'm doing great. And I do love the pod for a lot of reasons. First of all, it's, you know, when we're off doing our stuff, I get to see my bestie. Uh, But it's just a different way to get out content. And while it's easy to say that, oh, everything is research grade, uh, in content that, that that we pump out, the reality is, you know, we have various levels and various various ways of educating markets, educating enterprise and users. You know, the tech beltway, and you know, I think our audience appreciates our ability just to crank something out, uh, not only in a different medium, but it's almost all opinion, right? So, no, it's good to be here, and I am uh, transmitting from uh, my bunker in uh in colorado here doing a really poor job of taking time off i did take monday off i'll I'll admit i didn't work a whole lot on monday but um uh i'm back and yeah ready ready to crank it out what what do we have in store here dan yeah i mean look we've got a bunch of earnings from last week because you and i know that well it's not our favorite thing in the world to do a lot of our big tech companies clients you had oems you had software companies that reported last week and we just weren't able to get to them. And then we had a big week this week. And I was over in Munich. Um, I was at the IA Mobility Show. Uh, and that's we'll talk a little bit about that. But there's also a bunch of other tech news that you know we're not going to talk about today. But I just right. want to flash it across the screen. I mean, there's a huge Digital Markets Act move with all these new gatekeepers, Pat. We're probably going to have to come back and talk about that at some point. Yeah. Um, you know, there was, uh, you know, some other interesting uh, breaking stories that came out throughout the week with Apple and Huawei. We'll kind of talk about that a little bit on this show. Um, but it's just been a really, it's been an interesting week for tech. And, you know, it, it's fascinating how fast things are moving. And of course, this morning, I don't know about you, but uh, I got up early. I was walking on the treadmill because, you know, I don't run because I'm too old, but I was walking uphill, like a couple degrees. Yeah, that's why I'm so fit, everybody. It's the walking. Um, yeah, I'm pretty but, sure know, those triceps are from walking. Damn. Yeah, well, you know, I walk on my hands. That's how I feel. <laughs> so, um, good good one. That. Good one. It is a good but, one. But, uh, you know, and of course, I'm listening to, you know, pundits opining about what's going on now with the iPhone ban uh, for, you know, Chinese uh, government, Chinese employees and, or workers. And doesn't everybody work for the Chinese government? <laughs> I don't know how that actually works, but I'm I'm pretty sure. Well, like I said, we'll adjacently get to that topic later today. But just, you know, so much cranking along. Um, I guess I'll do the quick disclaimer, you know, for everybody that's watching this show. If it's your first time. Remember, we focus on the analysis. Uh, we try not to do too much of the news. We'll do the recap where we have to do. But we really try to get beneath what's going on with these different companies. Um but the show is for information and entertainment purposes only. So while we are going to be talking about publicly traded companies, please don't take anything we say as investment advice. That's the disclaimer. Um, Pat, you know, like I said, we're going to cover four earnings from last week and their implications. Then we're going to cover a couple of pieces of news from this week. Uh, first is going to be Dell. We're going to hit MongoDB, Broadcom, Elastic. And then we're going to talk a little bit about Huawei and their new crazy sweet phones. Are you using one yet? Don't answer that. Tell me later. And then uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the announcements that came out of IAA, at least some of them. It was a huge event. Couldn't cover them all, but we're going to cover some of them. So, Pat, why don't we dig in because we both have to get on with our day and we want everybody out there to get on with theirs. Dell Technologies. Yeah, so Dell Tech absolutely had a smashing uh, earnings. Uh, They were up, you know, 10 percent the day after and they've kept. They've kept that sustaining uh, going. Now, the interesting part is their business was way off. Uh, you know, data center was off uh, 11%. PC was off 16%. Uh, but they absolutely cried. They had a 53% uh, EPS beat and a 10% uh, 
revenue beat. And, and again, folks, if you don't if you don't cover the markets, uh, don't get confused by investor expectations uh, versus guidance. Right? They're two two very uh, different things. What this basically said is they outperformed on what Wall Street analysts thought that uh, that they would do. Now, the interesting part uh, here is they not only crushed it, but they gave a really good and positive forecast. Um, one thing I wanted to highlight was this was Dell's first time really drilling into down into what they're doing in AI. And, you know, Dan and I have talked about this many times on the show, right? There have been, I think there's like different tiers of companies who will be taking advantage of AI uh, in different ways, but also different timeframes, right? You have your uh, data center play. You have your, uh, and you, you could even split that into uh, hyperscaler and on, on prem. You have the data center edge. Right, let's say a drive-through of some sort, uh, and then you have uh, the far edge, which are things like devices, smartphones, IoT PCs, and and tablets. And each one of those has a different way that they're going to be able to take it fuller advantage of of generative uh, AI. And what what Dell Tech did, in fact, specifically Jeff Clark. By the way, I was joking. Hey, you should have Jeff Clark uh, talk every earnings. The stock goes up eleven percent. I'm sure he would uh, he would find that funny. But what Dell did is they did bring out an AI TAM, right? That said it's going to increase 19% uh, CAGR over the next few years to $90 billion. They also created a new classification called AI servers, which uh, is nothing more eloquent than saying the servers that have giant GPUs in them said it was a 20% of their server mix uh, in, in in the first half. They also said they have a $2 billion worth of backlog of a specific server. This is one you could put four H100s in, it's called the XE9680. And they said their pipeline is significantly higher. So I'm thinking five billion, is it 10 billion? Uh, and they went, then they went over in the different ways uh, you know, kind of a macro view, uh, Dell validated designs for AI. Dan, you and I have had uh, two guests uh, on the 6.5 that, uh, that talked about this. Then there's the Dell Professional Services, and then there's the Dell Precision Workstations that in many ways, shape, or form is doing the uh, initial uh, programming, but also as we've seen with ML and DL, uh, workstation programs are capable of uh, taking advantage of that. And then finally, to make a long story longer, uh, they went through uh, six customers that uh, are all about uh, AI. The big, the, the one big surprise to me was Workday, right? Because I'm thinking, interesting, Workday. Kind of thought that was a SaaS play. Uh, and they would plug into, into IaaS. And then then I remember, oh, okay, Workday timing actually was built before the cloud, but was part of uh, internet, very similar to Salesforce that started, uh, you know, Web uh, 1.0. But anyways, market loved what they heard, up over 10%, and they're sustaining it even when they got uh, downgraded uh, yesterday. Yeah, I think the you know, the overall market reaction was very positive. I think what you said in the beginning, Pat, was probably the, the most important uh, nuance. I should have just it's, stopped there. <laughs> well, it's just the most important nuance. And the nuance is, you know, th there's an argument because Dell had a great quarter relatively. Yeah. You know, someone said to me once, when you put the bar on the ground, it's easy to hop over it. Now, <laughs> that's good. I'm not. Oh, that's your second didn't... one of the day. Do I need to start having a tally? For the yeah, I'm smart, funny, funny things you said. This, by the way, isn't unique to Dell. So don't take that as a knock on Dell. What I mean is the market yeah. largely saw the pullback. For Dell, the market was very aware, and so was Dell, of the PC pullback. They knew that there's many quarters of, of lower demand. And so the guidance uh, has been largely reset. And that's part of the process of a market moving from a kind of a upturn to a downturn back to an upturn is going to be yeah. readjusted guidance. Now, of course, everybody valuates company based on future earnings. That's how valuations are done for businesses. So 
seeing that the company can outperform means higher multiples in the future. You know, but then there's all the extra extraneous factors, you know, that could be higher for longer interest rates. You know, we're seeing Fed policy continue to indicate that, you know, we may see a longer lag, you know, but then the market's also largely uh, very strongly associating value right now with AI. So I think Dell's announcements around AI, providing classification clarification around how it's going to monetize AI was encouraging. And of course, um, you know, I think what we learned from looking at Lenovo, HPE, from Dell and others was all of them have pent up demand because yeah. basically right now, any company that can can get their hands on A100, H100 uh, inventory from NVIDIA can sell it through. And it's also a margin enhancement because everybody's got a ton of price elasticity right now where they can get it. If they can get it, they can sell it. And if they can sell it, they can sell it at a premium, which kind of offset the fact that, you know, quietly the CPU market has just tanked. I mean, it just absolutely tanked. And this is what's really happened there is for anybody that's, you know, kind of curious about why that happened. It's because there hasn't been more budget enabled for AI, for IT. What's happened is all of the budget has been moved over to, to the GPU spend or for AI spend. And this is going to be what I believe is going to be a short term to midterm trend. It's going to go over four to six quarters, um, maybe a little bit more. And I'm not saying at that point uh, it's going to be a huge reversal, but what's going to happen is we're going to realize a lot of inference is going to be done still on a CPU. It's still going to be done on a uh, on an edge device, on a PC. Pat, you've written about this. I've written about this. We are kind of in this, this major flux of investment around training, but we know a lot of inference for applications can and will be done on lower cost CPUs. Um, and that should eventually swing the pendulum back somewhat that way. The most interesting thing, Pat, that I think we are going to watch, which is a little bit less related to Dell, and I realize I'm talking more macro, but you really hit the Dell stuff well, is that the, is is that will NVIDIA see a steep cliff? Meaning you're seeing these numbers and these guides of just these extraordinary highs. And at some point, remember like with Zoom, Pat, when Zoom had that high from the uh the pandemic and then remember they were still growing but people saw the stock value it dropped by like 80 percent 80 percent because what ended up happening was it was growing at a much more moderate pace but it was growing at a pace over the huge post pandemic surge of demand so what i'm saying is you might see a point now where nvidia sustains the size of revenue that it is or even is growing at mid mid single double digits for gpus and data center ai and people are going to say, well, that growth has really slowed down. Yeah. But remember, it grew at like X hundreds of percent for multiple quarters. That's going to be really interesting, Pat, is what's going to happen when more and more AI moves, when we kind of see the pendulum swing from training to inference, once these companies have fully built out at least their immediate needs for capacity for AI training. That'll be interesting. But you know what? Yeah, it is going to be interesting. And, and uh, NVIDIA either has to find another next thing right which i think they've done a pretty good job going from ml gaming to ml to dl to generative ai or they go vertical integration and go after intel and amd on cpus which uh this new you know grace is is really optimized for uh, a cpu plus a gpu but it would yep. be interesting to see if they could field a competitive kind of generic uh, processor that, by the way, uh, still you can get a hundred percent margins on it, That's a very, uh, that's a very good business. And by the way, you know, I know this was a segment on Dell. So let me just kind of close out the loop. Dell will benefit on all ends of this because they have, you yeah. know, the lowest low end to the highest end and they'll, you, they'll be putting the NVIDIA parts inside their highest end AI servers. But of course they also have a huge line of servers for just traditional compute, which can handle a lot of acceleration for traditional AI inference or at the edge. So that's part of the beauty of Dell, why they do $100 billion in revenue is because it has one of the broadest portfolios on the planet. Um, but this will be an interesting thing to watch. So good coverage on the on the Dell side, Pat. And sorry, I got a little macro there, but you know. it's so, you know, No, no, I think we, you know, part of this podcast is we, it's organic. And I think we get into what we want to get into. And I yeah, think I'm, our I'm into it, buddy. That. You know me, I'm, you know, I'm an economist at heart. Are you? I'm, a, I'm an economist and a financial advisor at heart. But by the way, this is not financial advice. So I'm just being very clear about that. Yeah, don't don't um, go there, Dan. Don't 
I won't there. even I won't even recommend stocks to my kids. I'm like, ah, don't ask me. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> so, exactly. I, I always buy the wrong stuff. If I actually, you know, took my own advice, I'd be a lot better off. Um, <laughs> anyways, so let's go into MongoDB. We're going to talk about a couple of software companies that are also inflecting very positively around the AI boom. I mean, look, you know, we all know that the data platform, the operational data layer is what's going to make these really killer applications for AI. So who are the companies or which are the companies that are going to get a big tailwind? Well, Apparently, MongoDB is one of them. You know, it had a very strong quarter um, and it's the market is starting to see, I think, its story move from being a really developer centric product to a business centric product where companies are leveraging the technology uh, and its, 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 its capabilities to be able to build, implement uh, and, you know, continuously uh, innovate on AI's capabilities in the app for applications. So. You're talking about a company that saw its revenue grow 40% year on year, which in software SaaS uh, is very, very strong. It saw the SaaS part of its revenue grow by 38% um, and now is 63% of its Q2 uh, overall revenue. Um, you know, the company is still not profitable. So, you know, on a gap basis, but uh, it, it's getting very, very close to being able to do that. And it's creating a lot of cash flow. Um, you and I were at the, uh, event in New York City. So we had time to talk to many of the company's executives. We had a chance to talk to many of the company's leadership as well as its customers. Talked to some large banks. Uh, we talked to some other uh, large companies and startups that are building on Mongo. A very positive sentiment out there, Pat, on the company. You're seeing vector search, um, you know, which is all about simplifying generative AI and semantic app builds. And we'll actually talk about that more when we talk about Elastic's earnings too, because we're seeing this kind of you know, moving across the industry. Um, we're also seeing that it's deepening its partnerships. So part of this earnings uh, and also at, at the event we were at, Pat, is the company was busy announcing, you know, that it's expanding in its cloud uh, integration. It had a big announcement this quarter around Google Cloud, but really uh, MongoDB has deep ties and roots across the hyperscale cloud uh, community. And so across the board, Pat, this is just one of those plays that, you know, if you believe that this generative AI boom is sustainable, then you're going to have to believe that there are, are critical components, uh, services and tools that are going to be required to enable this continued build out. Um, vector search, operational or, you know, developer data, um, you know, is going to be critical to basically building out the apps of the future. And you can see it here with what MongoDB is doing. You can see it there by the momentum. And like I said, I think one of the really important key trends is this is moving from really a developer kind of nerdy tool to something that the market's beginning to see as a very critical business component to companies that want to build generative AI apps for the future. That was quite uh, an analysis of, of the things you pointed out. And what I think is so interesting about MongoDB is how they moved from a best in breed database to what's now a data platform. And, you know, we've seen uh, a couple companies who are doing that, right? And it just, it just makes sense, right? You, a company starts off, they have a killer app, and they then try to extend that into something that is, that is more and, and that's, that, that's bigger. It's a challenge, right? Because you, you try to grow, 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 and you have to make expenditures. But absolutely, it's working out for uh, MongoDB. I mean... 78% uh, gross margins is pretty incredible at that growth rate, right? So it's not like they're giving away products, they're growing. And, and if I look at what makes a successful uh, data play, one of them is the hybrid multi-cloud. Now, MongoDB doesn't support every feature on every cloud, including uh, its, its uh, on-prem capabilities, uh, but it's enough to get the job done. They used AWS as an anchor point and then move to uh, Google Cloud. And that's exactly uh, the types of companies you wanna be working with. I totally agree with you on the, the vector adder and it's called Atlas Vector Search, which by the way, competes directly. Uh, well, not, it's funny. It sounds like it competes directly with uh, Elastic, but the two actually work together uh, as partners. Uh, but uh, congratulations to uh, MongoDB and eye-watering 40% growth at 
uh, gross margins. So uh, let's talk about a company that might be acquiring a company that might be a really huge mega deal in the near future um, that had a kind of, what do you want to call it, Pat, when you just constantly do what you do and it's always solid? Uh, Broadcom. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, Broadcom does so well so often that anything other than a complete uh, blowout quarter kind of gets a a complete yawn, right? And if you look at the prior quarters where, you know, it's just amazing how consistent the company is, right? Uh, the prior three quarters beat by 1.75, 1.65, 1.64 on EPS, and then on revenue, beat by 0.31, by 0.21, uh, beat by 0.34. Investors freaking love this uh, consistency. Uh, they did come out with um, growth, 5% growth in, in both uh, semiconductors uh, and uh, software, but uh, Wall Street uh, wasn't that impressed uh, this quarter. Now, one thing uh, about this is I look at uh, you know these AI darlings and I put uh, Broadcom in there. There has been a softening across all of those, whether it be Marvell, uh, Broadcom, uh, NVIDIA, and even uh, AMD. And the stock, Broadcom's been up 56% in, in the past uh, six months. And what's happening stru structurally uh, uh, inside of the business is that AI is growing leaps and bounds, but the non-traditional, the traditional non-AI networking is, um, is not able to make up for that mega growth in AI. And it's amazing how many people don't understand that. Sometimes I just wonder if investors actually understand a uh, stock or not. But then again, potentially the, the same uh, themes that, that brought the stock up 56% in six months are the same ones that they're finally understanding. Hey, it's not a one for one in all of Broadcom's business if NVIDIA goes up, right? There's a portion of Broadcom's business that goes up when NVIDIA goes up. So final uh, final thought on VMware, I think everybody's waiting for this. It's gonna add a just a huge element of dynamicism, dynamism uh, to uh, the company in terms of, of what they can do. The cash coming in, uh, the $2 billion investment uh, in the cloud is gonna be exciting. I am expecting some divestitures, and I think as we've seen in every type of uh, acquisition, there's going to be some overlaps, uh, particularly around uh, the uh, the OPEX side. I'm most excited about is the way that I think VMware is going to be run going into the future, which is going to be more like a startup um, as opposed to kind of a giant monolithic uh, software company. Yeah, I think you hit some really good points there. I mean, nobody quite knows how it's going to run. There's been departures within the executive ranks, um, the comings and goings. There's been some talk about whether Hawk's going to kind of take the VMware part of the business and become his central focus with Charlie running the uh, kind of traditional chip and semi. But, you know, Hawk's also not one. He's a delegator. I mean, look, we know the GMs of his businesses and, you know, people have a certain opinion about Hawk. But one of the things is you got to know him. He really does entrust the leaders of the various business units to run those business units. Uh, you know, the Broadcom way or Vago, we should call it in terms of his stock, AVGO, Broadcom. I never that that one, like I've ne always wondered why they didn't change the ticker. Like people would follow. Don't worry. They'd get it. But anyways, the, um, you know, huge huge margins i mean you look at like most products up over 70 percent uh huge earnings on every share um uh very large dividend on a per share a very significant dividend i won't say very large because the shares are very expensive but i'm saying for people who own you know it's a highly rewarding stock but the behavior is really it's about profit maximization he does what most companies should aspire to do and it's sometimes scrutinized but is you know, he invests heavily in the parts, pieces, and products in the business that make money. Uh, when he acquires companies, he pull, he basically he'll shed and divest anything that doesn't create revenue uh, and profits. And you can be pretty sure that that's going to happen with VMware. 
I mean, it's a, it's a very safe guess to bet that there's going to be some things that are going to get chopped off. They'll find buyers for it. They'll, they'll be, and, and by the way, um, that's just the way it goes because what he's going to do is look for the cash cows in the business. He's going to maximize the cash cows. He's going to get rid of the parts that don't make a lot of, a lot of sense. Most big companies, they tend to fund their pet projects and their loss leaders by, you know, having a couple of cash cows. Um, and then there's Hawk and his style is I only want cash cows. And that's why the company performs so well. I mean, you know, the company's guidance was a little, uh, you know, it was a little bit calm. From what the market wanted i mean you said it really well pat there was these ai darlings that kind of hit that were the first to sort of be able to say we are going to be uh implicated Im impacted by a tailwind of all this ai investment that hasn't changed but i think what a lot of people don't realize is that this is going to happen in phases and that the expend the investment is not all happening at one time and for instance a company like a broadcom though you're talking pennies on the dollar for networking against every gpu that's sold so it's not like, and that's what some of the people were missing is like, they're thinking, well, how much content from Broadcom gets sold with each one of these NVIDIA pieces? And then of course, NVIDIA has got some com competition within its own ranks. And so not every, you know, some of these companies that they're all in with all NVIDIA networking, there may be very minimal content, but also it's still there. But over time, as this scales to maximum pro uh, proportion, like traditional compute data centers, Broadcom is gonna be riding that wave all the way through. Um, I'm really interested, Pat, by the way, this is the quarter for the VMware deal. If it doesn't close this quarter, it might not close. Having said that, my stance has not changed. This is the quarter. It's going to happen. Um, but, you know, again, why would you think it might not happen? I'm just I'm just I'm just curious. I just think it's going to want to be done. I think the this is just what I guess I'm saying is I think it is going to happen. Nothing's really changed. But I think Hawk was uh, steadfast in having it happen this year. And so I think there will be some disappointment. There will be a very hard push to get it done this year. Um, and, and so, it, and, and by the way, one of the things you and I have learned is just the longer things do linger, the more likely they don't happen. And that is just kind of the thing that's happened with big deals. It's the NXP deal with Qualcomm. It's you know, kind of all eyes on Activision right now as it's gone, you know, yo-yoed between to and from of whether or not it's going to pass. And the more these things linger on, the more likely of scrutiny. And at some point, a lot of these deals have, um, they have, uh, what do you call that? Like, uh, uh, you know, pills in them, poison pills in them, where if they don't happen by a certain date, there's a breakup fee. And we've seen that happen as well. And again, I'm not familiar if there is one in this deal, but you know, things do have to eventually close because Pat, you, you and I know, and I mean, having never done m and at that level, but one of the things you do know is that m and creates a lot of uh, cultural uncertainty inside of businesses. When it's going on big deals, especially deals of this size, you got to acknowledge for Broadcom, it probably hasn't created all that much, but for, uh, for people at VMware, I guarantee you the last six months have been very, there's been a lot of uncertainty, especially knowing that you're moving between cultures that are so different. Um, but Pat, I'll leave it there. Having said that, another strong quarter. I think I tweeted something along the lines of, you know, just another boring quarter of just doing exactly what you say you're going to do by Broadcom. <laughs> so, you know, yeah. nobody likes that. It's no fun. But anyways, onward, upward, here we go. Hey, let's talk about a company we've never talked about in earnings before. Elastic. So we brought Elastic up. Um, by the way, you know, Pat, you know how you and I love a good deck? Um, one of the best decks I've seen from an earnings deck for a company that people probably largely don't really understand much of what they do yeah. um, was Elastic. So we'll put it in the show notes. But if you actually check out the deck, it was very, very interesting. And, you know, Elastic's really trying to tell a story right now. We talked about vector search. We talked about, uh, you know, the whole idea of search in the relationship. Well, look. When you're doing generative AI, you're talking in natural language to a machine. When you talk to natural language in a machine, there's a lot of complexity that goes into taking that natural language and returning you something generatively that is not only looks and reads like real text, but that's actually accurate. You know, we talk a lot about hallucination. So, you know, the company did a really nice job of sort of telling its story of how it's grown through these inflections and that AI is the next inflection. You know, we've seen huge growth. We're seeing, you know, data grow at exponential. We're seeing, um, 
you know, basically the ability for natural language and the ability for a API that can connect all this data that companies have, enterprise data, as well as uh, internet data, and create these applications that are going to be not only, you know, in compliance, they're going to take care of PII privacy and data. Um, they're going to allow human-like interactions. Um, and of course, they're going to be able to take foundational and, and models that have been pre-created and use them in a way that's utilitous to individual businesses. And this is that trend and shift of training to inference that I talked about is this is what's going on, but who's one of the beneficiaries? Well, you know, in a, a, one of the beneficiaries is going to be a co any companies that enable intelligently plugging into your applications and then doing enterprise search. And enterprise search is really the ability to use your data. So for everybody out there, you know, LLMs are great, but as we all know, it's, it's table stakes. When everybody is asking questions of the same data set, it's giving you basically what I would call search 2.0 or new filter filtrations of recommender engines and, and filtering, filtering systems, which has kind of been the baseline of AI. And if you don't believe me, go back and look at where Jensen Wong spent a lot of his effort in his early data, days of building out foundation uh, frameworks, uh, Jarvis, Merlin, recommenders, uh, filters. This was where it started. And so now it's how do we plug in and do this very, very quickly? Well, Elastic focuses on observability um, within its search, Elastic search platform, focuses on security within its platform, and then it focuses on actually having an extensible, flexible search that you can use. Now, one of the things that I also really like about any company that's a little bit smaller, like Elastic, that's doing things, we've had the chance to talk. I've spent some time with Ash, their new CEO, very bright guy. But the company is doing a very good job of telling its story through its customers. And I can't tell you how much I admire that. Um, you know, it went down the list and it looked at uh, who's using its observability and why. You know, it was able to talk about Comcast, Orange, uh, European company. It was able to talk about BMW. Um, and it actually breaks down in their earnings deck, but really why companies are using it, how they're using it, and how they're going to basically be able to drive it to create fast responses, handle multi petabit scale, uh, and then, of course, relevance. And relevance is what you talk about when you talk about hallucinations and accuracy is not only can it search through all the data paired with the public internet large language models, but can it find you the most accurate, most relevant without hallucination? And that's what I think Elastic is trying to accomplish. It's gonna be a competitive market, but they were early to this market. They have a very, very uh, important subset of customers. They plug in with the public cloud providers and they're really making a nice pivot from the sort of first generation of filtering of the internet through traditional search to generative text, where I think Elastic is gonna have a significant growth opportunity. So strong quarter, strong growth numbers, Pat, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, I agree with you on the deck. And in fact, uh, it was uh, 34 pages of information before they actually got into uh, the first quarter uh, 24 uh, results. Uh, revenue uh, was impressive, not overly impressive, at, uh, at at 17 percent but one thing that I really like here and again uh, I was talking earlier about um, best of breed uh, narrow uh, startups that that grew right them them basically going from a search capability to observability uh, security uh, and then search and then you have generative AI which uh, depends on a vector uh, database and essentially what the company has been doing for years. And for all you listeners out there who don't understand what a vector database is, is you have a standard database, which, you know, think of it as a giant spreadsheet uh, in the data center um, that's text and numbers. Uh, vector databases are for things like images and videos uh, and any content that is not uh, text or numbers. And essentially you create vectors to be able to do uh, pattern matching and run generative AI uh, alg algorithms uh, against that. So uh, my uh, prognosis for uh, Elastic is they're going to see some uh, mega growth once the generative AI uh, kicks in. When I say, well, what do you mean, Pat, you know, kicks in, we've got all this stock market hype, probably 1% of database, sorry, of uh, data center usage is generative AI uh, right now. And also it does Good machine point. learning. 
and generative AI doesn't mean that analytics, machine learning, and deep learning is 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 going to go away. I, I like to look at these different methods as as a bag of golf clubs, right? You wouldn't just take one golf club out to do uh, 18 holes, use your driver uh, on the putting green uh, or use your putter uh, to drive with. I mean, maybe after a few drinks, but uh, not on a day where you're actually trying to- You ever do seen Tin Cup when he played the entire round with a seven iron? I, I did, that was pretty yeah. uh, That was pretty impressive. But you couldn't, it'd be harder to do that with a driver for sure. Uh, a lot harder. And those aren't <laughs> gonna go, those aren't gonna go uh, away here. So I was impressed too. You know, you 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 mentioned something about their their customer set, and it is impressive how they can get their customers to uh, say yes. And go to slide twenty six of this quarter's investor deck, and they're they're huge companies, right? And they're not all born in the cloud. They're they're a uh, you know you have born in the cloud stuff like uh, like Uber, uh, and then you have the I call it brownfield companies with people like uh, uh, Home Depot. So, a pretty pretty impressive uh, uh, crew here. And uh, Dan, we may or may not uh, be going to one of their events uh, coming up. Rumor has it. Rumor has it. These six five may be going to their big event. Maybe we'll see. All right. So, uh, Pat, let's talk something a bit more controversial. I know you used to be a big power user of Huawei devices, and thanks for lending all of your personal information to China. I appreciate that. But um, kidding, maybe I don't know, whatever. But the uh, big news: Huawei's back in the phone business. They'd kind of disappeared, or at least they disappeared outside of China for a while. Yeah, this is a great intersection between a lot of conversations that we've had on the six five, and one of them is the ongoing saga of China versus US uh, regarding uh, cutoffs in it in the technology right and I always like to tell the big picture of this this goes back uh, decades to when uh, China was blocking you know companies like IBM and and Cisco and then the the, the thing that's true today which is most online services are blocked, U.S. online services are blocked in China, and China essentially copies, you know, the Facebooks, the Twitters, uh, Google Search, and and things like that. So uh, he here we are today, where the U.S. thought it had cut off Huawei from advanced semiconductor tech, but also uh, you have to get a waiver if and when from the U.S. federal government if you're going to provide anything to Huawei. But here this mystery, I'll call it the mystery phone, right? The P60 and the P60 Pro come out. Uh, on, on day of launch, the company didn't even talk about what processor was inside, didn't talk about whether it supported 5G uh, or, or 4G, which, you know, quite frankly, was, was bizarre. Uh, and then you saw phones that were provided to reviewers. Now, uh, remember, this is a China-only phone. Uh, Huawei sampled this uh, well beyond uh, Chinese uh, uh, Chinese phones. And so even, even the people who were writing about the phone didn't even know uh, what, it, what it supported. And oh, by the way, the timing uh, just happened to coincide uh, where the highest level uh, U.S. diplomat on trade, uh, uh, Ramondo, came over and was visiting, right? And then the entire Chinese press got around that it was a it was a it was a it was it was a feeding frenzy. Um, a lot of questions about this phone, and, and then and then what popped up was uh, Hynix memory, right? Hynix is not allowed to sell flash memory to uh, Huawei without a waiver, right? And even um, Hynix is trying to figure out where this came from, right? Was it black market? Uh, was it left over uh, from 18 months ago when the initial sanctions were put in? Nobody quite knows. And by the way, why didn't Huawei use indigenous flash? Why didn't it, they use indigenous memory from China? That's a weird one, right? You and I have talked about how 
uh, Micron has been uh, cut off uh, or greatly reduced uh, from uh, certain types of applications here. There was some dialogue about Qualcomm and what this meant. Here's the bizarre part. Qualcomm zeroed out Huawei a long, long time ago, right? So no revenue. But for some reason, again, I question the intelligence of, of the stock market on this one. Uh, SMIC, which, by the way, is the foundry that supposedly um, created this 7 nanometer N plus 2 chip, which, by the way, is, is close in characteristics to TSMC 6 nanometer. Right, it's not leading edge, not even close. Um, people are wondering uh, how they could possibly provide the volumes uh, to uh, 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 to Huawei. And the final bizarre thing about this is, I, I think uh, ten days after launch or something like that, the company did say, "No, this supports five G." But there's not a single video in any of the reviewers that shows it connecting to. A 5G network. 5G network. Yeah. You know, so again, this is why I wanted to call this Huawei's mystery phone. Uh, and uh, apparently, uh, one of our state senators uh, who uh, leads a committee on commerce uh, has opened up an investigation on this. Because if you think, how could SMIC do this without US technology? Hey, did they use the software, right? Any of the software tools from, you know, uh, companies uh, that that we cover, uh, did they use any of the core uh, IP building blocks that have restrictions in China uh, from the U.S.? Anyways, it's the mystery phone. We might be talking about this uh, a little bit more in the future, Dan. I don't know. Well, we all know for sure that they don't pay for a lot of software. That's kind of a well-known thing in China. All right, that goes back to that joke I made about VMware. How many VMware licenses does China own? <laughs> Anyways, um, but, you know, there's so many weird implications here, Pat, and this kind of all does tie together a little bit. You know, I've talked a lot about China and microaggressions for a while. And then, you know, there's so much kind of conflict between are we doing this well or are we not in terms of how we're managing this. You know, I, I shared an article, Pat, a week ago that talked about how the U.S. is using all these kind of sensors, these cheap IoT sensors and military grade devices um, from China rather than using, you know, it's just slightly more expensive U.S. based technology. I know it's not related to a phone, but I'm saying like it's like weird that we pick something and then we get really focused on it and then we don't pick other things. And then we are they really a threat or are they not a threat? You know, I was listening to one expert online this morning, a, a you know, a policy expert talking about, how, you know, China's uh, aggressive consideration of going back for Taiwan. You know, and it could happen in the next seven years. And it's funny how we just kind of shrug that off. That's a freaking huge deal. Like, it's a huge, huge deal. But it's like, well, it's not a problem yet. But that, you know, there's certainly consideration that China's ramping up to take military action with the U.S. I mean, look, us cutting them at the knees on AI is not like a small, in inconsequential thing. And we've also known for a long time that China is a massive market for so many of these technology companies. So many of them are dependent on being able to sell stuff in China. And when you take away the ability for them to sell stuff to China, it does actually cause an impact to growth for U.S.-based companies. So there is that kind of push and pull effect going on of can we sell and what should we sell? What's a military grade risk? You know, um, and is, is it just about military and defense or is it really just about technology leadership as a whole? You know, the war is a race right now. The war for AI is a race and the race is won by slowing them down. I think what we're seeing with the SMIC and the seven nanometer thing is they're going to find a way with or without EUV, with or without to be able to get access. And the way they'll get access, we don't actually know for sure, Pat, but I think you said something to me about gray market. You and I are talking about like, there's always a way this stuff ends up where it's not supposed to end up. And so, you know, what you brought up about SK, what you brought up about these different parts. But then, of course, if China wants to put off this perception that there are this powerhouse national capable of building their own stuff, but then they're still having to get all the, the capabilities, the intellectual property, the building blocks, the memory from outside of China. How capable are they and how much of this can they actually build? How much, how fast can they build? And then at the same time, Pat, didn't they just ban the use of iPhones from a whole bunch of their, their citizens, uh, mostly the government ones? But you know that was a pretty big step. And by the way, Apple got pounded this week based on the proclamations of potential lower sales in China 
Yeah. We already know Apple was making some strategic moves to go to, um, you know, India, building more in India, uh, at least from a manufacturing standpoint. But the Chinese market is incredibly nuanced and complex right now. And, you know, them wanting to build their own phone, Pat. I mean, like the Qualcomm thing, I think you nailed it. It's a total nothing burger. Qualcomm, yeah. you know, it's as bad as the Apple and Qualcomm relation conversations. Like, look, Qualcomm's already for over a year or two years now in their investor decks communicated what's happening with Apple. It's no surprise and no secret there. Same thing with Huawei. So that's a weird one to me. But the real question is, can China build at scale competitive devices without using intellectual property that's part of this um, ban or part of these chip controls? And Pat, unless I miss, unless I'm mistaken, to build a super phone that's going to compete with a Snapdragon or to compete with an iPhone, they need leading edge technology that's probably going to be processed below seven nanometer. So unless I'm mistaken, I don't understand entirely how they're going to do it at scale when there's no technology to manufacture those chipsets, at least that I'm aware of, uh, that they have the access to get their hands on. So, and I, by the way, I'm not saying I have all the information here, but if I'm mistaken, I don't understand how this is going to get done at scale. And by the way, China has a few billion people. So if this thing started to sell at scale in China, are they going to be able to, so how much capacity could they make of these devices? Not a lot. Not and, a lot. And that seems to be a problem for me to try to kind of math this thing. And so how big of an opportunity does it really become for Huawei? Um, and by the way, does Huawei have any chance outside of maybe selling their phones in the U.S. Of, in Russia, or sorry, the U.S., China and Russia? Are there any other markets that are going to that are going to really adopt these? So I'm going to leave that there. Very interesting, though, Pat. And there's a lot, there's a confluence of things coming together that are just making this China thing more and more interesting to kind of keep tabs on. Uh, I call this the hallmark topic it's the gift that's going to keep on giving here yeah. so let's have a little fun and, and, and let me wander off to iaa pat we had the six five represented this week at qualcomm iaa um i'm missing my bestie but i brought i bought our i brought our next uh newest uh a bestie uh part of the six five diana blast brought the connected series there um and i can't wait to put those out she did a great job um but uh you know IAA is kind of a it's an it's an event that converges sort of mobility and technology and then automotive and every other year they kind of flip between transportation and mobility yeah so this is the mobility year still full of cars vehicles drones two wheelers um spent a lot of time with Qualcomm spent some time with CEO Cristiano Oman and and, and automotive chief uh, Nicole de Gaulle as well as uh, chief marketing officer Don McGuire so the company was in full force there had its that is all its big wigs there. Um, and automotive has been a massive focus for Qualcomm. We've talked about this a lot, though, on the show. So I'm not going to beat that to death. But that $30 billion pipeline is coming to fruition with these continued design wins that are coming from BMW, from GM, from Volk, uh, from Mercedes-Benz. By the way, there were some killer concept cars there, Pat. Really, really cool concept cars, um, which is, by the way, you know, it's like bringing love together for me. Vehicles. Well, it's like torture. Yeah. You know, it's uh, you see these cars that may or may not actually ever see the light of day, right? We just got to get rich enough that we can buy the concept car. Jeez, so, you know, yeah, probably you know, not. Mercedes had a killer cool car, and so did Porsche. Which, by the way, I, I you know, by the way, is it Porsche or Porsche? Depends on where you are. The uh, I've never the quite known what's right. German uh, pronunciation would be the uh Porsche. Okay. Well, they're the right. They're right. And we're all well, they kind of created the name. So nine. Dr. Okay. Porsche. But uh, <laughs> anyways, Qualcomm focused on, you know, three or four really interesting things at this at this year's. One is gener is we're moving from kind of ADAS and sensor based AI in these vehicles to generative AI in the infotainment and and, you know, management maintenance of the vehicles. So some digital assistant updates we're focused on is how generative AI is going to be part of these building blocks of the digital chassis. Um, you're going to be able to kind of have an interactive digital assistant. So, and this brings a really interesting conversation about um, kind of when we're moving from device-based automotive control for infotainment to moving to fully onboarded generative capabilities. Because we all know that most cars today are, you know, a lot of people are plugging into Apple Play. A lot of people are plugging into Android-based systems. Uh, and by the way, this still could be Android-based in terms of the interface, but in terms of are we 
using the smartphone as the compute or are we using the vehicle as a compute? And then for generative tools, where does that processing actually exist? So very interesting, but some very future forward thinking about kind of how this digital assistant is going to uh, work together. Um, and then another one was the two-wheeler, Pat. So we've talked yeah. a lot about cars, but this was pretty cool. So And that was um, teased in the, uh, the financial analyst day you and I attended in New York this year. Yes. And so... You know, one of the things that Qualcomm really focused on, new partnerships with companies like Harley-Davidson. So, by the way, it's not only cars that are going to move to electrification. It's not only cars that are going to need a chassis, a digital right. chassis. So the ability to put building blocks of navigation and telematics and ADAS and infotainment and then be able to provide uh, the capabilities to do this with a smart chipset and then all on electrification, it's going to come to bikes too. So Qualcomm is able to identify a fairly large market expansion opportunity and also an opportunity to drive more design pipeline. And, you know, there's a there's a strong amount of demand. It's not just two-wheeler. I think it's just kind of the ability for Qualcomm to be the provider of intelligent platforms for sort of anything that rolls or flies or floats. I'm waiting to hear about the boating interfaces to come next, Pat. And, uh, the, uh, the, corporate, the corporate yacht. The corporate yacht and the yet and the yar and all the other things that you move around in. Um, so that was another strong thing. And a couple of other things that were interesting too is, you know, more partnerships with another one with BMW was announced. And Pat, this is kind of just a trickle of constant for Qualcomm. And you've seen they've kind of flip-flopped with NVIDIA. NVIDIA was the big, and NVIDIA, while it's gotten all this data center growth in business, quietly Qualcomm's kind of come underneath them and swiped a lot of design pipeline. And remember, this doesn't happen over like one or two years. So, you know, the the the, the thing is, is what happens is, is, over four, five, six years, this gets designed in and the revenue comes. So that's why a $30 billion pipeline is only yielding three or 400 million in revenue on a quarterly basis is because these designs take time to come out, but then the revenue pivots. So what has happened is you've seen the kind of a steady flat to decrease across NVIDIA's revenue. It's because a lot of these new designs have gone over to Qualcomm, which this has been a real strength in its diversification. It's been necessary given kind of the rest of the portfolio and what's going on in the market with mobile devices, for instance. Um, and then the last thing, you know, Pat, that was a big one is a design partnership with a mega hyperscale cloud provider for vehicles of the future. And that was a, a, a commitment that the companies, uh, AWS and Qualcomm made to co-innovate around the future in automotive and mobility. Um, and that came out as well. So lots of announcement. I realize we're getting close to that time and you and I are gonna have to run. So I'm gonna hand you the mic to kind of give the last thoughts on the Qualcomm stuff. Since you weren't there, I figured I'd try to cover most of the ground here. Yeah, you pretty much covered every single announcement related to, to Qualcomm there. Yeah, uh, well, what I there. would like to dive into, though, is the very provocative announcement. It was really a three-way announcement between AWS, Qualcomm, and BMW. And by the way, very rarely do you see this from AWS. And while I don't have uh, all of the skinny on it, uh, I feel like I can... I can say enough to say that Qualcomm likely brought AWS uh, BMW and BMW is going all in on the A100 uh, or variants of it. And as we know about Qualcomm, their IP, it's building blocks, right? So uh, similar building blocks, just more of it that you might find in a smartphone it will be supersized when it comes to Qualcomm, uh, Qualcomm's automotive. And if you look at the A100, it's likely a supersized version of that. BMW needed a development environment. And by the way, uh, AWS and BMW said, uh, this is about the Noya Klasse. That means the new class of, of cars set to launch in 2025. That is not a lot of time to be able to uh, crank this out. But there was a a quote from uh, Dr. Nikolai Martin, an SVP uh, at, at BMW, where he tied together AWS and Qualcomm Technologies, uh, which I, we don't see uh, that often. And I have to wonder what on earth is NVIDIA thinking about all of this? And you gave a little history. In fact, the history goes back all the way to where Intel was the preferred supplier for uh, BMW and with uh, Mobileye, and then that moved to NVIDIA, and it looks like 
uh, BMW is all in on Qualcomm at this point, as we found to have a developer development environment uh, taking those capabilities to the public cloud, where you essentially have endless uh, capabilities, uh, will be an interesting thing to follow. And I, I just have to wonder, is this truly the, I'll call it the credible beginning, meaning uh, Qualcomm, there were a lot of, um, what's the right word, uh, Yeti sightings on uh, Qualcomm's AI100, but it never really made a connection. This is the first public cloud connection we've seen for uh, Qualcomm's data center silicon. So I'm interested to see what uh, what's gonna happen in the future here. There we have it. So Pat, you did it. Can you take the rest of the day off? I've got one more, one or two more meetings. Terrible day off. Just want to say you did a yeah. terrible job taking time off. You're fired. Thank you. You're fired. All right, everybody. Great show. We covered a lot of ground, but we got to go. Hit that subscribe button. Join us for all of our six, five episodes. Pat, where are we going to be next week? We're going to be in beautiful San Francisco. <laughs> we'll be at Dreamforce 2023. It'll be a firsty for you, bestie. It will. Yeah, I've been to a lot of shows in my time, but uh, I've never been to a Dreamforce. Uh, pray for me in San Francisco. Uh, hopefully uh, nothing will happen there. Well, let me just say it's unlike any other Moscone event you've ever been to. So let's let this one go. We've done it. We've done the show. Hit that subscribe button. We appreciate you. We'll see you all later. Bye-bye.